you had brought uh, SLS and Starship, which is, of course, going to be super... No. Uh, the music should be, like, the preview stuff should be, but no. You as humans, no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yep, yeah, that's... Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that'll be interesting. Um... Oh, oh. there we go. <laughs> Thank you for more...
looks good. Okay. Um, I think that's where I adjust that. Uh, Morgan, would you have for breakfast? Of course it is. Of course, of course, your audio is also going out and ours isn't going out or something. Well, just I'm just like the way computers work. That they're not to be trusted. That they're not to be trusted. That can you imagine like if you were in construction and you used a hammer and sometimes your hammer worked and sometimes your hammer was acted like a sponge? That would be frustrating. And yet that's, that's our life. Yeah, that's our life, it, working with computers. <laughs> I don't get people, you know, people who like, like their computers. Like I am a, I am a wary crafts person with my gear. And it's always trying to betray me. Always. But they're not saying that they can hear me. <laughs> they're talking to each other. Yeah. Can they see us? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, then they're not. Yeah. Then, they, yeah. If they were saying there's, there's no audio, then we would know. How's that like through YouTube or through Twitch? Oh, like the real, real time. That's amazing. Very cool. Okay. All right. Let's see. Yes, we hear me. Okay, great. Well, then that's it. And you don't hear Annie, right? Everybody. Because Annie is just going to like bark a bunch of orders at us and, and tell us about space toilets and, What is it? What? Right now. Oh. <laughs> you didn't know that. <laughs> what? How many are on the, uh, will be on the gateway? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Now you're silent. We're audible. So I think it's all, I think you, 
it is dangerous though that like i've watched this technology mess up for you guys so many times that like how do you trust it yeah um all right well let's uh let's get started then hi everyone how do we do oh yeah right Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, June 15th, 2022. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it's going to be the Fraser and Morgan News Spectacular. So buckle up and we will go through every interesting piece of news that, is, that has come up. Joining me this week, the other half of the Fraser and Morgan show is my good friend, Dr. Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Fraser, hello. So it's been a while since we've done one of these. I am looking <laughs> true, forward to true. it. Back in the uh, back in the, the days of yore, Morgan and I would often be the only ones to show up for the weekly space hangout, and so the two of us would just hammer through all of the news and somehow turn what could have been a five minute conversation into an hour long extravaganza. And That's I look what forward. Friends do. Exactly. Yeah, we we are pros. Uh, the show must go on, and here we are to make sure that, that the show happens. Now, before we get into our special guest interview, I want to give a huge shout out to our good friends of the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They're our friends, our fans. They are the executive producers of the, this show. They call the shots. They tell us what to do. We do it, including suggesting guests for us to interview. And <clears throat> so if you want to join this incredible community, go to wshcrew.space. All right, let's get into this week's interview. And we are joined by Dr. Elena Dungia. Elena. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, Welcome, now everybody. You, now, you, you might appear familiar to people because I actually interviewed you over on my YouTube channel about a month and a half, two months ago about a about your, your work with Nyack. But... For those out there who didn't get a chance to see that interview, we're going to do the light version of that interview. And if you want to see the full hour long conversation, um, when I didn't know the answers to many of these questions, you should definitely check that out. Uh, so Elena, who are you? What do you do? Right. So my name is Elena Dungia, and uh, I am a professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And by training, I am a physicist and an astronomer. Indeed, I'm at the astronomy department at the University of Wisconsin. But since a few years, since three years, I started working on aerospace as well, on a side of my research. And, um, you know, and now I feel I'm into the game for aerospace, especially, you know, with the dream to bring one day maybe humans to Mars. Was, was that easy to do, to just, like at some point just go, you know what, I want to aerospace now. Uh, right, I, it didn't work that way exactly, but so, um, right, so a few years ago, um, I had, a, you know, um, um, a healthy problem. And so I thought that, you know, life could be short. And so um, I was very happy about my science, but I thought that I wanted to do something also more you know, more for society, some science that could be more applicable than, than not just astronomy. I mean, believe me, I'm, I mean, I'm a fan of, a, I'm an astronomer, I'm a fan of Gaia and the new data that came out, you know, this week, I work on that as well. But on the other side, I also thought, okay, what can I do, you know, to help uh, humans in some problems where maybe I can provide some help, you know, that more related, it's more related to what I do. And so with another friend, Paolo, so we uh, came up, um, with this you know, um, idea of uh, thinking about how to shield the humans from, you know, from radiation, from cosmic radiations once they go into space. Because what people don't tell most of the time, and now you know, the community is more sensible about it, but sometimes at the private company, what they don't take into account is that once humans go into space, uh, you know, they're very fragile. We are very fragile species. You know, plants are less fragile than us. <laughs> So yeah. we don't survive into space, and because you know we are con constantly, constantly uh, you know exposed to cosmic radiation, which are you know particles coming from 
solar wind, you know, solar ejections, basically protons, electrons, but also protons coming from the galaxy. So, and they are, you know, quite energetic. And we know about that also because, you know, when there is instrumentation in space outside, you know, the Earth, we know that, you know, the telescopes get also damaged by, by those radiations. So, so we wanted to do something, uh, you know, my dream was to, to contribute in some, some way, you know, uses, using uh, our physical intuition and, you know, physical training. It's actually a problem for physicists to start with. And the idea that we had was uh, going back to the old ideas of, you know, using, looking at the nature, how nature does to protect the humans on Earth. So, you know, Earth, our planet is very, is very special because it's uh, not, not only because it's beautiful. If you look at from space, you know, when we have images from, from probes uh, from other planets looking into the Earth, we see this magnificent planet, you know, with water and, you know, and, and um, uh, atmosphere, so, so bluish, you know. But uh, it's also, it, it also has a, a magnetic field. And the magnetic field, you know, it's actually um, protecting us uh, from cosmic rays, from these, you know, particles coming, from cosmic radiation particles coming from space. So they are actually deflected once they come closer. What? The other reaches the ground. Um, we went back to this idea of nature because nature is always inspiring better, you know, humans than what we could think. And, um, but what we did was to come up with um, a new model that hasn't been provided before because in the past uh, there were attempts to think about, uh, you know, creating magnetic fields to um, adopt outside the spacecraft, but those magnetic fields um, turned out uh, years ago to be very difficult to build up, especially very expensive and also very heavy. And, you know, weight is, is an issue in space. So we came up with a different configuration for a magnetic field that would be um, not exactly as, uh, as powerful as the one on Earth, but a rescaled version that could actually work. And so, and that's, that the idea, you know, um, was a physical idea. So we made a physical model as, as physicists. And now we are at the point that NASA is betting on our model. And so is financing us to actually um, start thinking about how to build up and, and the challenges associated to that. And, and of course now um, from being uh, astronomers and physicists, uh, we are actually collaborating with engineers because we need you know, to do the design and we need to think about also superconductors you know, to keep um, this system working in space. And we are you know, in the phase now that we, um, we are um, trying to realize um, our, that to make feasible our idea. So now you said that, that you actually, like, did you build a prototype of this? No, we did not. We have, okay. a, we have the idea on, let's say, on papers. Uh, well, we had, a, you know, we had some students printing with a 3D printer, just, you know, how these coils that would generate a current to generate the magnetic field, you know, uh, would um, would look like, and they printed it like you know a small, a small um, demo. But we don't have yet, um, you know, um, um, a workable uh, a prototype. Not yet, so it's too early. What, what kind of force is required to deflect the particles? So the magnetic field will be um, extended outside the spacecraft, and what we'll do with would be that you know once the particles are approaching the, the spacecraft they will just get deflected and and this magnetic field is will be generated from coils uh, placed in a certain configuration now the forces are they are you know generated during uh, when the magnetic field is generated by the currents in each coil you know in each uh, magnet so those will be magnets that you know will generate the magnetic field that will be outside the spacecraft and there will not. There will be no magnetic field inside the spacecraft where the astronauts live. We don't want that. But the forces are pretty strong, and the currents are also required pretty strong. Um, that's why it's a challenging, um, you know, um, um, it's a challenging problem, and we need engineers to help us, you know, in figuring out how to do it. But it's not impossible. It's actually these days quite feasible. Thanks to the new technology, the new superconductors, which are you know much less 
um, they're, they're now, they don't have big weight anymore. They're like tapes, uh, thanks to the coils that can be, you know, uh, also lighter. And also thanks to the fact that, you know, if we go to Mars, eventually the, you know, um, the spaceships uh, like a starship will be actually the one used and they can load, they have a high payload, so they can load a lot of, a lot of weight, you know, on, on their way. So they can, so it's, it's probably more feasible than what they've been in the past. And the forces are big, but um, on the other hand, we are thinking about, you know, to create a system that will be um, strong enough, you know, to resist, to be resilient to the strong magnetic forces that will be generated. I mean, I, I think about like a like a proton that's been accelerated, like a cosmic ray, and they're the ones that you're most worried about. How much energy is contained within those cosmic rays that you have to shield the passengers against? Right. So um, let's say the calculations we have done, they have been done for most of the cosmic rays. They are around the 500 MeV. So between 100 to 500 MeV. So they go from what are reject the, the ones that are ejected from solar wind to a little bit more energetic. Of course, the, those are the most common. So the, the flux of those particles is very high. Those are the most energetic ones on Jeb. Those are the ones that are most dangerous because the, the, those have higher energy, so they penetrate easier. And so but when you say are, MEV, sorry, that's mega electron volt and then giga electron volt. Yeah, sorry. Volt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mega electron volt and giga electron volt. The giga electron volt are, they penetrate, um, and, you know, but, but a strong magnetic field could still deflect them. And so we are, we are thinking, so our preliminary results shows that around, you know, a few hundred MEV for um, cosmic particles, we can deflect almost 50% of the particles. So the radiation absorbed from, by astronauts will be, will be actually reduced you know, in, in a significant way. Now with the, with the NIAC, we are trying to, um, you know, to push this result uh, and to shift it you know, to see the most energetic particles, what is the, you know, the, the rate of, uh, of scattering that we will generate for the most, you know, for the most powerful. It's not only protons, you know, there are also ions in, in space, like iron, you know, those are less, but they are, um, you know, they are heavier. And the problem with the cosmic rays is also that once they approach the spacecraft, the presence of the aluminum, you know, the material of the spacecraft, you know, will not be able to um, really to reduce their, you know, to to scatter them, but it will be able to, unfortunately, you know, the, for the particles that are going through, those will will become, you know, um, they will um, degenerate in uh, in secondary particles, mm. and some of the secondary particles are very dangerous, like neutrons, because they are not. Once you produce them, you know, at the, in in the spacecraft or close to the spacecraft, they will not. Uh, you know, they will not be shielded anymore from, from the magnetic field. So we're trying to build up a system that reduces also, you know, reduces the risk to generate the secondary particles. I mean, when you think about even the Earth, like we're getting bombarded with cosmic rays today. I mean, you're, the Earth is definitely protecting us because of its magnetic field and because of the atmosphere, but we're still getting some. And so yeah, we, we get some, I think 10% uh, around. And also yeah. we take secondary particles, you know, uh, the secondary particles are usually, um, you know, some of those uh, are reaching, uh, you know, the earth. Muons are an example. So those are generated in the high altitude of the atmosphere and they are, you know, secondary. So they are not the primary particles that hit the atmosphere, but they are secondary. So we still have, um, still have those, but, you know, but the percentage is actually reduced. So the earth does, does quite a good job and so i wonder like if you protect against the say the 500 mega electron volts the stuff that's coming from the sun and maybe some of the lower power cosmic rays you are still removing a fairly big chunk of the cosmic rays that are 
inflicting damage. Do you do you have a sense of how much you can lower the radiation load for astronauts? Yeah, we have a look at yeah, we're looking into that because we are trying to measure now things in terms of uh, yeah, um, absorbed doses. Um, so we definitely, if we remove, uh, if we can deflect the particles uh, that have a lower energy, those are the ones that are more, you know, more um, numerous. So it's the flux is higher and their effect can be dangerous on humans uh, on a cumulative base. You know, if you accumulate them, you know, over time, yeah, they yeah. can be, whereas the JAV particles, uh, those could be one event sometimes, but they might be uh, much more. So they, they, if they penetrate and they go through, you know, the body, they deposit a higher energy. So they are much more, you know, dangerous. They can be really, they can be really bad. Like they go through so, your DNA um, and, and shatter it. DNA, you could, yeah, there's, there's still, you know, there's still a lot of debate about what is really the, you know, the effects of radiation. There's not enough data so far because we didn't we haven't been in space for too long yeah. yet but definitely but, there's a lot of problems but you know we we're we're thinking about that reduce quite significantly um you know uh, also the absorbed radiation but the cal we're still doing the calculation on the way now because we are still uh, nope. to complete our NIAC so we're not there yet the, it's interesting I mean when we think about, I think when people think about these ideas, it feels all or nothing. But like when you get an x-ray from the dentist, you're getting a radiation load because you're absolutely, you're just, you're wearing a, you're wearing a lead apron to try to reduce the amount of, of risk that you, that you take, but you still do. Or every time you hop on an airplane, you're experiencing yeah, a larger exactly. radiation damage and so i think if there's a way like right now i forget the number it's like 200 times more radiation if you stand on the moon than if you're standing on right. the surface of the earth it's a lot but if you could knock it in half you're immediately yes. helping reduce people's chances of getting cancer down the road well indeed you know the pilots uh, actually the um, air companies knows about this problem so the the amount of time that pilots uh, um especially in Europe, I'm not sure about US, but in Europe, the amount of time that the pilots can can really fly on high altitude is uh, um, is exactly how much of radiation they absorb during, uh, you know, during a year. So they, they don't, they can't fly more than that. I'm not sure about the United States, but the same process, the same criterion is has been applied to astronauts to go to the ISS, International mm -hmm. Space Station. So they can only stay in space for the amount of radiation that you know NASA has decided that is you know is good enough not to, to I mean to have some risks, but you know but you know to to tolerate um, without having you know too much troubles. So so there is a, you know there is a, a, there are limitations right now, and of course you know this shielding uh, this artificial magnetic field applied to a spacecraft would reduce would allow you know longer permanent you know lo longer um mm -hmm. permanences in in space also on the moon uh, although you know for now it, it's it will not be practical for artemis project on the moon because it's too early so we don't have yet you know the technology in place but for mars it's mandatory yes yeah it's and imperative. so it, it's been about two months since the NIAC grant was awarded right ish yes how how is progress going so what we have, have a team we have a team now <laughs> so okay. we did, you know yeah we formed the team so we formed the team and uh, we work you know um uh, at you know at still wisconsin madison and we work with the engineering department and also we are yeah, we're collaborating with a professor that uh, for the hour who is actually an expert in superconductors and cryogenics so um and then we are we have we have students uh, you know they've been enrolled in the, in this program and so we we are working hard uh, you know to complete uh, our our schedule and our agenda what when is your deliverable when do you have to provide your final report the final report has been has to be provided in february 
So we have now in a few months to work hard and start thinking about what are identifying the challenges of our yeah. idea. That's you, what NASA wants. Do you think you will you get to the point that you'll actually build some prototype hardware or do you think it's still just math? No, right now, yeah, right now is math and also, uh, but math, but also, I, you know, identifying uh, all the uh, possible problems that would come up, you know, before you really put your hands in a prototype, because that's what NASA wants, you know, wants to know, um, wants to understand what are the challenges. And yeah. then, you know, if we, uh, once we identify them, there is a phase two for the NIAC where we, we are hope, we hope we can apply. That probably will be next year, and um, you know when we can be funded to, you know, to overcome those challenges. At that point, you know, we start becoming, we start thinking about the prototype. Yeah, maybe I, to be tested in space. Uh, you know, maybe in at the ISS first, and then you know. That'll be space. your 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 phase four grant is when you actually will uh, probably for, uh, phase three at the phase end three, when you yeah. really when you build, build the prototype. The prototype. Yeah, yeah, very cool, very exciting. Uh, well, if people want to keep keep watch and and keep track of the work that you're doing, uh, what's the best place to do that? Well, if they uh, you know if they type my name and surname, which is not that easy, but you know if they get the quantity too, uh, I have a web page where not only I talk about astronomy, but at the end there is a, you know there's a. a I would have had for the crew to go into space. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for giving us the the update. And and again, congratulations on the NIAC award. And good luck. Uh, I think a lot of us will feel a lot more interested in flying to space if we know we can do it with a reduced risk of getting cancer or yes. radiation poisoning. Safe. That would be in lovely. A safe, yeah. a safe trip Thank you tomorrow. again. All right. Thank you. Take thank care. You for interviewing me. All right. Good thank luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Morgan, where where did you want to start? Oh, I think we got to start with Gaia, right? I mean, sure. this is just this is cool stuff. We'll get to those measly spacecraft things <laughs> later. Yep. This, yep. this is this is big stuff and yep. uh and I think, you know, Gaia just never ceases to amaze. Um, so we got last week, or I guess really this week, a couple days ago, uh, the third sort of tranche of data coming out of the Gaia mission. And to kind of step back and maybe let's just kind of review what Gaia is before we sort of start geeking out about all, all the elements of it. So Gaia is a spacecraft launched, I think, in 2013 by ESA. Yeah, eight with and a half the, years ago. <clears throat> with the stated goal of um, making astrometric observations of a billion stars in the Milky Way. Uh, and so astrometry is sort of one of the sort of three main ways to think about things in the sky. So you have astrometry, which is how the star is moving across the plane of the sky. Where is it located? How is that location moving across the sky? That's like the oldest form of astronomy. It goes back to, you know, ancient observers who noticed that the planets were moving positions and things like that. that. That's astrometry. Then there's photometry, which is how bright the star is on the sky and how that brightness is changing. And then you have spectroscopy, and that's the actual distribution of those photons in terms of their wavelength. And that tells you composition and, and lots of gnarly things like that. Um, on the face of it, the main mission for Gaia is astrometry but it actually carries on board instruments capable of doing all three. And it uses all of those together to help make its astrometry as good as possible. And that was sort of the initial data that we were getting from Gaia, because we got that first data release that was basically all the positions and motions of a billion plus stars on the sky. As the mission has continued and data has been built up, they've started to sort of repurpose data from those supporting instruments to help make the photometry and the spectroscopy elements more stand on their own more. And this mm -hmm. third data release really kind of brings that home. Uh, so let's kind of start with just the big numbers. So this data release includes updated 
positions for two billion stars in the Milky Way. And, and did is... you see the map of of the Milky Way? So now they've got the, this map of the Milky Way, and then there's this little green blob that shows you the amount of the Milky Way that has been mapped, that we know all of the stars. And it's a surprisingly big blob of the Milky Way. And it's amazing to think, like, like, it's not just here's an artist's impression of the Milky Way. Like we actually know where all of those stars are. I think amazing. all their data viz for this release has just been amazing. Yeah. Just been really, really beautiful. Um, and to your point, we've two billion stars is a big enough sample size of the hundred billion or so stars that might be in the Milky Way that we're actually kind of looking at a statistically significant fraction of the stars. And that area is now big enough that we're looking at stars across a wide range of galactic conditions. And that's one of the things that sets this data release apart from the previous ones. Yep. In addition to those 2 billion stars, or, or of those 2 billion stars, they also measured the radial velocity of 33 million of them. So that's basically how fast the star is moving towards or away from us. Uh, and from those 33 million, they've figured out like a million new binary uh, binary stars. Yeah. Uh, they also um, observed and provided photometric or brightness t t measurements, time series for 10 million variable stars. And I think maybe coolest of all, they have a million stars that they measured the photometry of on a patch centered on the Andromeda galaxy. Yes. So, so many of those stars are stars that are actually in Andromeda not stars that are in the Milky Way. Yeah, I thought that was great that they're now starting to map Andromeda too. And just to kind of put that into perspective, Gaia is sort of the second or third generation of this astrometry mission architecture that ESA has done. The first version called Hipparchus, which launched in 1989, observed a total of 150,000 stars <laughs> uh, in the Milky Way. They were about the 150,000 closest stars, which was a, a breakthrough for, for 1989. But we now almost surely have measured the positions of more stars in the Andromeda galaxy than we were able to measure in the Milky Way just, you know, 30 years ago, wh yeah. which is just mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And this data release also included data on 156,000 asteroids. And, and why not throw in 30 moons of the outer planets as, as well? Really, the only thing that they didn't really provide here was any information about exoplanets, which is one of the things that people were kind of thinking Gaia might yeah. be able to contribute to. And that, and that hasn't was, really come in this data release. Yeah, and that was definitely a big surprise. We, we were expecting, like, not only would Gaia be detecting planets through the astrometry method, but it would dwarf the number of planets that have been discovered to date. Like they would dump tens of thousands of planet candidates into the hands of the researchers. And, and that didn't happen. Although it does make you think then that it is actually still there. It's, it's hard just... to imagine that they haven't, they don't have good data on some planets, just yeah. the amount and quality of the observations that Gaia is making would be it'd be hard to make those kind of observations and not get something yeah. of interest so you can imagine that in a future data release we're going to see more of of that and they gave us an update of the picture so th they do this every time with each with each data release they give us a picture of the milky way but it's made up of the stars. So it's recreated. They're going through the database. They're gathering the locations and the brightnesses of all the stars in the database. And they are recreating the night sky, showing all of the dust lanes, all of the positions. They're showing the center, the core of the Milky Way. They're showing the large and small Magellanic clouds. It looks like a photograph of the sky, but it's not. It is purely a database disgorging pixels. Yeah, it, it's just amazing. I think all their images, all their data viz in this dump was just was just incredible. Yeah. And, and then there were really two big discoveries that they talked about in this data set, neither of which really relies on the astrometry, which is sort of showing you how the mission is expanding beyond its kind of original goals. The first was is that they uh, were able to actually observe star quakes happening on other stars. 
Um, and so these are, you know, like earthquakes, they're vibrations happening in the stellar atmosphere. But they're not pulses. Pulses were something that, um, which are like radial motions, is something that Gaia had uh, observed for the first time in the second data release. These are more like lateral motions and uh, things happening. And they were able to figure this out using astrometry because as the, uh, or I'm so sorry, using photometry, using right. the brightness observations, because as the surface moves around, it's causing uh, subtle, very, very subtle changes in, in brightness. And this is something that Kepler has done a lot of work on, the Kepler mission, yeah. and really kind of revolutionized this. But Kepler was a photometry mission. That was the goal of Kepler, was to make these high accuracy brightness observations. That wasn't the goal of of Gaia, and yet now Gaia is going to provide quality photometry across as many yeah. stars, basically, as Kepler was able to, because its field of view is so large. And so these are these are this this is a fairly new science. It's astro seismology, and it was pioneered by watching the sun, and we were able to detect these ripples, essentially these star quakes inside the sun, and Kepler was able to discover them as well, and it was it was quite a surprise. And the thing that's really important about astro seismology is it gives an independent way of determining the age of a star. And this is one of the things that actually working out the age of a star is a very difficult process. Astronomers have, when they see like an individual star, they can be accurate to within about 5 billion years of how old the star is. But not, not with, great. Not great, no. Um, but, but with the astro seismology, you can actually, based on the ripples that are coming through the star, you can get a much better sense of the age of the star, where where it is along the process, how much of its internal structure has been converted over from hydrogen into helium and, and so on. And so finally, astronomers have this much more accurate method of determining the, the age of stars. And and the fact that the guy can jump in and assist in this process is is really exciting. Yeah, and just the overall ability to infer structure inside of a star, you know, even for the sun, we don't have a real way to go and crack it open and look inside. We're stuck looking at the surface. Yeah, and put seismometers so, on top of it. Yeah, exactly. And and so, you know, barring some magic seismometer technology, seeing these vibrations in terms of the light output that they create is the only way we're going to be able to understand sort of population scale how variations inside stars uh like happen and, and yeah. what what that might tell us about things like the age and also the composition and, and the composition is the other big uh sort of discovery that gaia put out and that was based on its spectroscopy instrument which sort of was included principally to help uh Gaia understand basically what kind of stars it was looking at and match those up with, with databases. But now they've been able to sort of tease out more detailed uh, spectrom uh, spectrometry for some subset of these stars. And it, it made an observation that is sort of the kind of thing that only Gaia could do, which was because it was looking at stars that were spread so spatially across the Milky Way, they observed that the metallicity of stars is variable across the Milky Way. That's not a big surprise. But also that that um, metallicity, which again is the content of stars, the elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium. So we're talking about lithium on up, uh, he heavier Man. stuff, stuff that didn't come from the Big Bang. And so that's telling us that these stars are incorporating material that is more processed that's gone through more iterations of supernova and seeding new stars etc and those the stars that have that more processed material tend to be closer to the center of the galaxy and closer to the plane of the milky way and that's really important information as we try to tease out the history of the galaxy in terms of you know how did it form how has it changed since it's formed? And what are the forces that are driving those changes? Yeah. And, and this yeah. is a clear indicator that there are processes that are tending to concentrate material in certain areas. And maybe that's not a huge surprise. I mean, the, the center, like downtown in a city, the center of the galaxy is the densest, busiest part. 
And so you would expect the most mixing of old and new material to have happened. But now we have like a precise observation of where that's ha happening and where it's not, what we call a gradient. It's not and just like an on and off switch. There's a spectrum and Gaia for the first time has sort of identified where that spectrum lies. And, and there, like this work has been done using Gaia data, but it always had to be matched up with some other spectroscopic database of stars that was a fraction of the number of stars that Gaia is is looking at. And, you know, we know we talk about the the Enceladus sausage. Um, we talk about the the various dwarf galaxies that that we that we now can see the tidal streams, the tails that have been wrapped up inside the Milky Way. And a lot of the times this work had to be done. You'd get Gaia to detect the motion of stars on a similar pathway. And then you would also look at a separate database to get some, some uh, spectroscopy to try and see if they're related. And now it appears that Gaia can start to just being, be able to provide this data on its own. And the kinds of discoveries that you can make with this are things like, like finding the stars that were once together in star forming nebulae, like the one that formed the sun, we could search the Milky Way through the motion and the constituents of the stars to find siblings of the sun and try to trace back the nebula that we once formed inside of and to be able to see that in other things. And one of the other things that they did was they were able to detect a galaxy that Andromeda had gobbled up in like 9 billion years ago. And again, like doing this, seeing is in Andromeda and not just in the, in the Milky Way. Yeah, this is really just kind of a sneak peek of what every day is going to be like once Vera Rubin comes online. Yeah. And it's going to have a, a different set of strengths and weaknesses than Gaia does. And they'll complement each other in, in many ways. But this idea of having sort of re reasonably good observations of brightness and composition and position across vast swaths of the sky is going to make these sort of longitudinal understandings of, of our history possible in a way that they weren't before. Now, and we've danced around this with things like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, but the depth and the quality of the science, of, of the data, has not allowed the science to go deep enough to sort of answer these more specific questions. And Gaia is kind of teasing us around some of these things saying, hey, there's a lot out there that our big picture understanding of the galaxy doesn't add up to. And then Vera Rubin is gonna come behind and make a new dimension on that, which is this really high frequency of observations. You know, the whole night sky every three days. We're gonna go back and say, wow, that's a weird looking thing that's small scale moving in a way we didn't expect. Yeah. Now let's go back to Gaia and see what its position and motion in the galaxy is. Mm. And, and those two things are going to come together to allow us to see not only the here and now from Vera Rubin, but to reconstruct the history of that object using the proper motions uh, measured by Gaia. And that's, it's going to be like Gaia is to Hipparchus for um, Vera Rubin is to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or something like that, where we're going to look back and be like, oh, wasn't that quaint? We had measurements of, you know, only a, a hundred million objects or something. And now it's it's billions on billions on billions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I hope that a, that a follow on like a Gaia++ mission is is developed at some point because the field of astrometry has been so it's given us locations of white dwarfs and neutron stars it's hinted at all kinds of really interesting exotic objects and told us so much so congratulations to everyone on the guy team and uh i can't wait for the next release oh, we had to wait four years for this one it was two years two years and then four years so we may have to wait 2026 for the next uh for the next release let's talk about space launch system yes it go bad. <laughs> oh. uh, it, it cost money. Yeah, all uh, the money. Yeah, so this actually isn't specifically the Space Launch System rocket itself, the SLS um, launch vehicle that NASA has been developing for two to 50 years, uh, depending on sort of what it feels like in the moment. 
Um, this is, yeah. has to do with actually the, the getting the thing from the hangar to the launch pad called the, the mobile launcher platform. And you've probably seen the videos of these things from the space shuttle era or the Saturn V era. It's that really giant, really slow uh, uh, like platform crawler that takes the thing from the vehicle assembly building out to the launch pad for the rocket to launch. And that's important because you got to get it there. Um, and it's also tricky. You can imagine the weight of that thing and then the platform actually absorbs the launch itself and then has to pick up and wheel back to to the factory. This is a hard, hard thing. And so NASA signed a contract uh, with a company called Bechtel to develop uh, the next generation mobile launcher platform. And this um, this platform will be necessary for the second generation of SLS, the sort of bigger, badder version of it, because it's just a lot heavier and more substantial than the block one that we'll be hopefully see launch in the next year or so. Uh, that first platform is actually going to re be reused from one that was developed for Constellation back during the Bush administration in the you know early mid 2000s. Uh, and but that system isn't substantial enough, isn't strong enough, basically, to handle the heavier duty uh, project of, of moving the second generation of SLS. And so NASA signed this cost plus contract, which means they guarantee Bechtel a certain profit margin a few years ago for $383 million. And that was to design the launcher and then to build the thing. Uh, so we're now about a year away uh, from construction starting, you know, hopefully end of the year, but that's probably optimistic. And so far on the $383 million, they've spent $436 million. Um, so that's, that's a little bit more than the whole thing was supposed to cost. And it was already supposed to be built by now, uh, which is not ideal. And in fact, if you kind of take what's been spent so far and look at it compared to what's left to do, this $383 million thing is likely to cost more than a billion dollars yep. uh, in, in the end. And this is and the it, second one, right? Like they already have one. This right. They already two. have one. This is the, yep. like the bigger, badder one. Yeah. Um, to handle like the block. The, to the handle block the block two. 1A, I think, or block two or whatever right. they're calling the, 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 the heavier duty, more like Starship competing uh, yep. one. $4 it's easy to point the finger version. here at yeah. It's easy to point the finger here at, at Bechtel, and a NASA investigation basically does that. But <laughs> it's clear that NASA is also to blame because a major source of the overruns in time and cost is that NASA still hasn't actually given the company the specifications for what the rocket is going to be. And so it, it's basically designed this thing able to support block two of SLS, yep. but we won't tell you how big it is how much it's going to weigh or how much thrust it's going to generate. Yeah. All of it. Like it needs to be able to handle anything. Right. And yet we've expected it to be done by now. Yeah. And uh, how come it's so expensive? Yeah. And so it, this is sort of case in point of the challenges that NASA has had with procurement in the human spaceflight program in particular in the last decade or so they, you know, they're forcing Bechtel to work quickly on the notion that it needs to be ready in time for block two to launch in 2026. But block one hasn't even launched and is somewhat behind schedule. And the fact that they're holding to this 2026 timeline um, is making them start so early that they haven't even finalized plans for the rocket yet. And, and so, you know, they're paying more than they wanted to pay. It's all just kind of a mess yeah. and we don't really know if, is block one even going to be a success are they ever even going to build block two it, it, it's hard to know yeah um and i mean while we're having this conversation nasa is rolling sls back out to the launch pad and they're going to attempt to test whether or not it can hold its fuel for the fourth time <laughs> yeah yeah it, and so it's so it, it, you know, space is complicated and it's hard enough when you're trying to do one thing and then the next thing. It's even harder when you're trying to generate, to develop phase two of a rocket for which phase one doesn't exist. 
And, and then I think you open yourself up to trouble when you basically say, well, we're going to pay for it no matter what it costs. And, and so now NASA is going back and trying to renegotiate this as a fixed price contract. But like, who would sign that contract? Yeah. They already have a contract for as much as it costs plus 10%. So wh why anchor yourself to a fixed, fixed right. price solution? And then you look at how commercial crew has gone in terms of being basically on time and basically on budget. You yep. know, these, these kind of overruns just on the on the mover thing make Boeing's problems with Starliner seem pretty straightforward. Yeah, it cost NASA $150 million to send three astronauts to the space station on SpaceX, on Crew Dragon. That's right. You, you could send you 10 compared, missions for the yeah. cost of this one thing. No, I mean, well, sure. But I mean, like it, it's looking like an SLS is going to be $4 billion a launch. So, so that's a lot of flights to space. Exactly. Now, obviously yeah. SLS will go to places that crew dragon just can't go. But, but what about human rated Falcon heavy? That can go a lot of more interesting places. What about an upscaled version of crew dragon? that can go to the moon. So it's a, it's a, it's a really tricky time. And, and this kind of is unfolding in slow motion and, and Very it's not slow looking motion. good. So, but we've only got a couple of minutes. So let's sort of talk about the young upstart that is nipping at NASA's heels. Yeah. So this is all happening sort of in the looming shadow of starship. And, I mean, Starship also is not a thing that has flown. It's flown a little farther than SLS, but not a lot farther. But it also hasn't cost, you know, tens of billions of dollars. Yeah. And they got a big win this week by getting approval from the FAA, basically for their Boca Chica launch facility. Uh, and this was an, an environmental impact review that was basically required because they're trying to move from a sort of wholly experimental to a facility that will long-term have commercial operations. And when you start to have those regular commercial operations, especially along a protected seashore, there's a lot of paperwork and mitigation to make sure that you're you know, behaving responsibly for uh, the environment. Yeah. And going into this, SpaceX made two big changes to their operations to try to sort of streamline this. And the first was to design, make changes to the Raptor engine to ensure that they could use basically off the shelf methane uh, as their main propellant, rather than needing to more highly refine the methane to sort of spacecraft grade. This will be just sort of bog standard methane. And that eliminated a lot of like machinery and factory and pollution related with doing that refining on site and doing that purifying there. And so by being able to basically truck in the fuel they need and load it up and off they go, they have, you know, a, a lower opportunity for disrupting the environment. Yeah, they I mean, it, it's interesting to see like there's still some environmental protection issues like uh, excessive lights on the beach that can cause confusion for the sea turtles. There's the there's a lot of sound issues that they're going to need to sort out because these things taking off and landing are going to be incredibly loud. And there are issues, traffic issues, you know, they're, they're bringing a lot of infrastructure into a fairly poorly serviced area, but, but it is a big, a big step. And you know, it's, it's pretty funny how now Musk is saying like, we might launch in July or maybe August. Like I thought he was ready to go and right, the FAA yeah, just gave him the old green light. And yet, Oh, actually we're still, and it, this was the suspicion that we had is, you know, they're implementing an entirely new version of the of the Raptor engine, the Raptor Two. They're they're implementing systems that have never been tried before. This is going to I I would be surprised if they even launch through July or or August because there's just so many things they got to get right. The uh, their launch platform has got to be able to handle the load of this monster. It doesn't have to catch them yet because they're going to land in the ocean. But still, it's uh, it is an interesting, interesting time. And we I mean, doesn't it feel like we're in this limbo now while we're waiting for Starship to demonstrate that it actually does its job? And SLS is just spending money, you know, hand over fist. 
and yet we kind of don't have a proper dependable solution for flying to deep space yet and yet we're supposedly only two or three years away from the first artemis crewed crewed missions and, and the and the and the Mar and the musk missions to mars yeah well i think we can all agree that that's that's not going to happen i mean uh Musk but, will argue with you on that one. They're, they're, I believe they were going to send humans by 2022. Well, they got a few months left to, yeah. uh, to, to get that done. What, when does the, when does the Mars window close? It's soon. They've got a couple of months left still. Yeah, it is. It is relatively soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are kind of in a weird place. Like I think all the indications are that things seem to be going well overall with Starship, but yeah. there's no guarantee that that will actually pan out. Um, and, you know, SLS will eventually overcome its problems, but sort of what will happen first? Yeah. Uh, will, I mean, cause it's not, will, will Starship fly first or will SLS fly first? Starship's going to fly first in a meaningful way. SLS might do one test mission, but in a meaningful way, Starship will, if unless there's a major problem, it'll fly first and start flying consistently. Yeah. That's not really the race. The race is between SLS finishing and Starship getting reliable enough and obviously cheap enough to convince the government that this whole SLS thing is stupid. Yeah. Um, and that is a much higher barrier to cross, right? There's a lot of good reasons and some bad ones that NASA and the government are supporting SLS, whether it's for jobs or whether it's to maintain you know, a, a independent national means to get things to space. Those are all things that people care about. But do they care about them to the tune of tens of billions of dollars when there is a thing that's a fraction yeah. of that cost? Yeah, people always say like, oh, SLS is stupid. They should cancel it and just go with Starship. And I'm like, yeah, but Starship is the thing yet. So like, what if it what if they can't get it to work? Like, like right now, you have to equate Starship with vaporware until it does its job and until it flies. And then it's got to demonstrate, it's got to work out the kinks, it's got to be able to return from space, it's got to land safely. It's got to do that probably for years before you can even consider making it human rated as a way to bring. And like even like it makes sense to like maybe launch on starship and maybe use crew dragon capsules to return until you've really proven it. So I think I can see why it's such a tricky time. Like obviously SLS needs to be canceled. <laughs> Just obviously, but there's no other option. And like, do you want to put your entire moon mission on hold? I, you know, if, if I was in charge of NASA, I would figure out a way to, to do Artemis without SLS with some combination of Falcon heavies, Falcon nines, Atlas rockets, you, you know, launch the lunar gateway, some kind of reusable tug that can go from the gateway down to the surface of the moon and back up. Maybe it's a starship that'll do it. You know, once you've got starship, like you don't have to, if you just fly your starship to the moon, then you don't have to worry about landing on earth, getting back through the atmosphere, none of that stuff. You just go up and down from the moon. So maybe that's a, a simpler solution. So it's a, I wouldn't want to be in the shoes of, of the people who are trying to navigate this tricky territory right now. It's a tough time. Yeah. And, and fortunately, I think there will be a lot to observe both on the SLS side and the yeah. Starship side for the remainder of the year. I mean, SLS is going to do their fuel test. One day it's going to hold the fuel uh and they will move i think pretty quickly in nasa terms towards doing a test launch yeah and obviously i think once starship starts launching in this hop and then to orbit phase we're going to see quite a lot of launching as we've seen with previous starship and falcon heavy testing yeah Musk um, said once a month they're gonna have a launch. they're gonna go into a launch once a month for the rest of this year which is a lot yeah maybe once a month for the rest of the year, starting in December. No, starting uh, in, in July. Like, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, um, I know, I know, I know. But I, I, I think, think I think that there will be a lot happening. And so yes. it'll be an interesting time. And a year from now, hopefully you and I will be sitting here 
chatting again and we'll have a much better grasp on the yeah. state of these things. SLS, yep. should, if SLS hasn't launched in another year, it's basically hopeless. Yeah, And, and it's a, if and they're not making time. clear progress on Starship, questions are going to start to rise. Like, is this worth NASA keeping their, their money in? Yep. Yep. We'll know a lot more. And on that note, I think it's time to bring this week's show to an end. Um, Morgan, what are you working on and where can people find out more? Um, yeah, you can always check out my website, morganrenberg.com. Uh, got some stuff that's popped up recently on, on EOS, the magazine for AGU. And of course, we've always got cool stuff up at uh, SciShow. Fantastic. And and so morganrenberg.com, best way to find you? Yes, morganrenberg.com. I don't update it much, but there's links to good stuff there. Yep. And, uh, and that's a good place to kind awesome. of see what's up. And of course, you can find me on all of the Universe Today related things. Uh, I've got an interview coming up on Friday with Dr. Sonny White, who was once with NASA Ames and is now working with Oh, I forget the name of his company. Anyway, he's the warp drive guy from NASA. So it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to have a conversation about. That. Now, don't forget about summer hiatus. We have two episodes re left. So next week, we've got Lori Garver. And then the week after that, we've got Lee Feinberg. And then we are on hiatus. So if you haven't already joined the weekly space hangout crew, they will help you weather through the tied the, you over, tied you over during the months long summer hiatus. And while you go through the desert of spaceless newslessness. Uh, all right. Well, Morgan, thank you so much for hanging out. Thanks for a special guest. Thanks to Annie behind the scenes for engineering the show. Thanks to all the moderators. Um, thanks for everyone watching us both on YouTube and on Twitch. A special thanks to Nancy Graziano for organizing all of the hurting all of the cats and we will see all of you next week thanks everyone take care <laughs>